Hello, everyone. We are back with our podcast, our series of films that are about uh, people who had experiences where they went to heaven and came back. Or I guess you could also say they, they saw heaven. Um, some people even called them uh, near-death experiences. It's a little bit more of a broader term, not necessarily Christian, but we're just focusing on the the Christian viewpoint of, of Christians who pass away, or not pass away, but of Christians who have the experiences of seeing heaven and coming back. And usually, uh, so we're only watching the films because we are, we're based upon um, cinema and film for this ministry. Uh, but usually it's um, someone who had this experience, they write a book and then that book gets turned into a film. And that's the same thing. We did 90 Minutes in Heaven last time and this time it's kind of the same story. Uh, this time we watched the movie Heaven is for Real, which is about uh, the Burpo family. I can't remember the kids. Is it Colton? Colton Burpo? Was that the boy's Sounds name? Sounds right. Um, and once again, this was a book. I remember when the book came out. I want to say it came out very soon after or right around uh, the first book, the 90 Minutes in Heaven book. Because the, the Heaven is for Real book, I believe, came out in 2004 and i think the heaven is for real the uh 90 minutes in heaven book came out like in 2003 or 2004 but the heaven is for real the one that we went over this time about the little boy the incident uh of him experiencing heaven happened much more soon much more recently as as opposed to the writing the book than the 90 minutes in heaven one did um so this is the story of the burpo family their little boy has appendicitis and he goes into the operating room and he does not officially die on the operating table, which is something we'll probably talk about later in the episode. Um, but he does have an experience where he sees Jesus and he talks to Jesus and he has an experience of some type of heavenly vision. Um, and then when he comes back, he's able to tell his parents information that he would not know before any of this happened which to them helps them see like, oh, this is something that, well, at least to them that it really did happen. Um, and then the, the book was written, came out, they made a movie. Um, I forget, I'm trying to remember the, do you remember the production company that this one, this was the, for this movie? No, but it was produced by T.D. Jakes. Yeah, he was a, I, I want to say that the production company was like a, uh, kind of a, a well-known one. It wasn't just a, um, because the other one was a nonprofit. This one, I want, I want to say it was Lionsgate, but I don't think it was Lionsgate. So we are uh, going through this little um, structured kind of questionnaire for our podcast now to help with an outline, a structure, but also to give us um, better, to do better on time. And so the first question, I'll let Will do the first question. Um, what are three things that you want to point out right away? Like, what are the three things you want to talk about that you watched the movie and you were like this, this, this right here? Um, well, in comparison to uh, 90 Minutes in Heaven, there was only one fairly big name actor. I mean, the dad has been in a few things, but the only one that was like super stand out was Thomas Hayden Church, the uh, infamous Sandman from Spider-Man 3, um, which I think it was interesting because it might be something small for a lot of people, but to have very few marquee names helps at least us pay attention to the story more instead of like paying, paying attention to the big name actors. So I thought that was a, a kind of commendable on their part. I mean, I don't know why um, he may have accepted the role, but uh, to kind of steer away from ho big Hollywood names is kind of a big deal, especially for a, uh, a movie that was pretty popular when it came out. I would say a second thing is... Once again, another weird portrayal of Christian marriage. Um, I'll try to be as delicate as I can with this. Um, they were not afraid to repeatedly portray intimacy in marriage. Um, was not a visual thing, but more of a uh, auditory discussions with the husband and wife, which in the marriage uh commitment that's fine but it felt like it kind of took away from the seriousness of a lot of the scenes um, also where it could have built a family unit more than it because it was really focusing on the husband and wife and it really took away from any building they could have had with the children 
um, to try to add more impact there. Um, but also on the kind of flip side of that, while that was semi-positive, they were very much, it felt like they were at each other's throats a lot towards the end. Um, but we, again, it didn't feel like they were close at all anyways. It was, it was felt very much like they had a few conversations, but it didn't really portray them being friends. I mean, the, it opens with the dad teasing and making fun of the mom for having worship group at their house. Yeah. Um, and I think the last thing, and I'm sure you're going to get into it, is the portrayal of Christians in this film, for some reason, not believing what the Bible says. Yeah, that's a big one. Um, and I'm sure we're going to talk about it in a minute, but simply put, it was hard to watch when the pastor gets up and is, is talking about his son potentially seeing heaven. And the first thing they do, the church says, no, we shouldn't do that. Um, that's really questionable. Uh, one person even says the heaven is not even a real place and she's a prominent, she is on the board of the church and she says that heaven isn't real. Um, and the church is even willing to throw out the pastor because he's, you know, questioning and thinking about the fact that his son potentially went to heaven. Um, and they're willing to oust the pastor because of his questionable beliefs and all he's doing is just trying to figure out if his son actually went to heaven or not. And so that was pretty troubling for me. Yeah. Um, that's definitely in my my top three. Uh, yeah. The number one, I kept thinking about that after we watched it, was they, they made a lot of references into the um, physical nature of the married couple's relationship. Which is not, I mean, it, that is totally okay. For, like portraying marriage, this, that is a part of marriage and that is totally biblical. I felt like it was out of place in this movie about their little four-year-old boy who went to heaven. It felt like they were always like making like advances towards each other, which once again, like that's part of marriage and that's beautiful and that's wonderful. I just felt like it was a little inappropriate for the subject matter of the film um, it got distracting after a while. It happened four times in the film. And about, I mean, I could understand once at the beginning. We're kind of building an intimacy, a closeness. But then things are going downhill for the family, both financially, emotionally, and spiritually. And they keep pushing this over and over again. Yeah, they're making like, uh, like jokes about it too. Like they, at one point, he's like, have you ever heard angel singing? And she's like, Oh, you mean like when we're together in the bedroom or whatever? And it's like, it's, it just, it was, yeah, that part was, was a weirdly uncomfortable because I'm like, this is, this is not about that. This is about this little boy, your little boy who had this like wonderful experience with Jesus. Number two. Okay. So I started reading that book from last time. Um, it's called after by Dr. Grayson. I can't remember his first name. His last name's Grayson. But I started, I haven't finished it, but I started uh, kind of hardcore listening to uh, my little Audible um, audiobook on it. And it's about, that book is about near death experiences and the similarities that um, all people have when they have a near death experience. What qualifies as, near, as a near death experience? What is, um, you know, what is, what is happening? What's the, the hypothesis of what happens when people? When people possibly, you know, leave their bodies or, you know, see some type of afterlife. So that book is not Christian in its viewpoint, though he is very, very um, honest with uh, the way he approaches it. He's not strictly materialistic. He is very open minded into what the evidence where the evidence leads him, which I think is refreshing. But in this book, in this book, in this movie, uh, the little boy who I, Colton, I believe his name is a uh, real person has a lot of the um, details that go into a, a traditional near death experience. One of the big ones is floating above his body and being able to see what's going on in the operating room, but also see his parents and like see those, those details and describe them. That's a, that, that one, a lot of people have had that experience. And then he also, he actually like saw and talked and was with Jesus in his vision. So in the one we had before, um, 90 Minutes in Heaven, Don Piper. Don Piper 
like never got to really talk to Jesus, I believe, in his experience. He saw the throne. He like saw that Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit, that they were there. But with uh, this little boy, he claims to he really like talked with him, got to sit on his lap, all of those things. Um, so I just found it really interesting that his experience, the one that um, this little boy has shares similarities with other NDE uh, experiencers. And then also I, you asked last podcast um, about NDE or people having visions of heaven that were in history that we don't know about, that we see some of it in the New Testament, but really this like going to heaven is like recent. Um, and then in that book, uh, they do mention historical written documentation of people who had these different experiences. Uh, one of them was a Swedish professor who he was skiing and he fell down um, this side of a mountain and like time slowed down for him and he could like think very quickly. And that man, I wish I had his name, he ended up being, so he had this near death experience. It was, is you know, he almost died, but he was able to like time slowed down for him. So this happened, I can't remember when did this happen? It had to be the 1800s. Um, but this guy, uh, ended up being a professor to um, Einstein later on. And he talked about this this experience where he was falling down the side of the mountain when he was skiing and that time seemed to slow down for him. And he was able to think very quickly and clearly, um, like faster than his brain would normally be able to think. And there is a lot of like speculation that that is uh, one of the reasons or one of the inspirations for Einstein's theory of relativity was that story from that guy. My third point, uh, interesting, they, this is also mentioned in the book too, um, I believe, but there is that painter. Do you remember the painting of Jesus? That's, she's a real person and I, I'm really bad about names. Also, she, her name is very hard to pronounce. I was kind of reading up about her a little bit. If you're on YouTube, I'll go ahead and try to put the, her name and the name of all the names I'm forgetting. I'll try to put them in the video if I can remember. Um, but she's this painter who she claimed to have starting to have visions of God when she was about four or five or six. And she taught herself how to paint. And she one of her fam most famous paintings is a portrait of Jesus called Prince of Peace. She did when she was eight years old. And um, Colton Burpo, the little boy, when he saw it, said that it looked like the Jesus that he saw in his visions, that he saw that that was the face that he saw when he sat on Jesus's lap and talked to him and everything. Um, so really interesting that we have um, another person who has like a visions or is an experiencer and their details line up. We're going to do a different order now um, instead of doing the message questions, we're going to do the filmmaking questions first. So what didn't you like about the filmmaking techniques used in the film? Um, I felt like it was choppy. Um, what I mean by that is that there was no consistent flow of events. It, it kept jumping between um, locations and people and things. And they were very quick scenes. Like the, the the scene where he goes to meet the psychiatrist, well, that must have lasted what four minutes, five minutes, and then we're on to the next scene. We're on to the next scene. Um, there was no real time, for the most part, to sit in a moment and you know be there with the characters, be there with the parents or the child or the conversations, and like actually sit in that and listen to it and contemplate anything. It was, okay, we got the point across. We need to get it across. Let's move on to the next thing. Um, and so that, to me, the, it was so fast-paced because I felt like they were trying so hard to get as much information into this film as possible that it, it left me both bored because I wasn't able to invest in it, but also flung around throughout the movie trying to figure out... Um, the, um, I guess the emotional tone of it because it kept changing tones with each scene. I don't know if I have like a huge criticism with like the filmy techniques used. I guess the only thing that stands out to me is the actual visions we get of heaven. So Colton has different times and different, actually different experiences after the initial experience where he like sees Jesus again. I don't know if that's how it happened in reality, but in the movie that's how they show it 
Um, and they always obscure Jesus's face. And whenever Jesus is around, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't feel genuine. It feels odd. The way they portray it, they have an actor who has just like a regular white robe on, like, like very standard. He, in all we see are like his hands and feet. We don't, we never see his face. And at the end they show um, that girl's painting and they're like, oh, this is his face. And that always seemed odd. The, the way they portray angels, I mean, they're like celestial beings of light. They do have wings. We don't really, can't really see or make out what they look like. Okay, I think that's a little bit better than the way they did it in 90 Minutes in Heaven. Uh, the he- the heavenly aspects of this film are portrayed more of like, um, not so not so much like ethereal, like 90 Minutes in Heaven, where it's more of like, there, there's one point where he has a vision of his uh, a sister that he was going to have that was uh, miscarried, um, and the way he sees her, they're like in a in a park. They're not like in like light in like a glowing light. Like he seems he tends to be in relocations. There is one part where they, he goes into a church, or he the first time he meets Jesus, he, his he goes into like the church that he knows that's his home church, but it's really like a vision of it. And there's like a vision of the heavenly host in front of him. He's like sitting in the pews. And then Jesus comes up to him. Um, and so I don't know, like I really, I guess the problem I have with this is not so much the way they made the film. Um, like I said, the it was, it was, I feel like it was inappropriate to have all the references to the, the mother and father and their like sex life. Um, but really like like you said like I liked uh that they had good actors in this um I think really my problem is with um probably the the question after this one which is do what do you have problems with the message so um we'll move on to the next question which is uh what do you like about the filmmaking techniques that they used what were some things that you enjoyed there weren't a whole lot that I actually enjoyed um I got more enjoyment out of the first movie we watched, um, I think, simply because of atmosphere, but also the way the scenes were lit, the way um, we were talking about with somebody else the other day. But 90 Minutes in Heaven was made like a feature-length film. It was um, designed that way. It, it felt like I was watching a film that would be in the theater. This movie was it felt like it was poorly made to the degree that yes it was high quality but it 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 was everything was so brightly lit everything was so um almost the same tone every everything was the same tone even like when they were in dark areas it felt brightly lit and so it it felt like there was no it felt like it was hard for me to engage or be mentally immersed in the story since it felt like it wasn't real. It felt like it was a made up story. The way that everything was portrayed, the way that people were acting, not just actors acting, but like the way the characters were acting. It felt like everything was kind of like a like an old fable. Like it starts off one thing and then there's like a conflict and there's a resolution in the end and everybody agrees with everything and everything's happy at the end. Yeah, and so we, that's kind of a criticism we had before. If for 90 Minutes in Heaven was really gray and dull in the way that they filmed it, this one is extremely light. I, I like that. I think that, like I said, it matches that tone of hopefulness for heaven. Um, I can see where it might look like a TV movie or like a Hallmark movie. Kind of had a Hallmark movie vibe throughout, which is more indicative of Christian cinema American Christian cinema. Um, I did like the bright colors. That's another thing that they talk about in uh, people of NDEs. They say that they would see like a field or flowers and they would just be so brightly colored. And literally um, Colton says that. He says they're just like there's colors in heaven that we don't we uh, I've never seen before. I think Don Piper said that in his interview too. Um, so I do like the brightness of it. Um and then you said something interesting in the beginning about not having big name actors in this, just kind of having 
I mean, you have uh, the Thomas Hayden Church. Is that his name? Uh, you have him in there, which is the first actor I recognized. And then actually the dad, the main guy, it's really, it's like the dad heads the, the front of the film. He's like the main character technically. is played by the, the, I think he's he's the um, guy from Mystery Men that's like the superhero that's kind of a jerk that gets annihilated. Again, not a huge name actor. It's only like small roles and cult hits. But they were good. Like everyone, they were not bad actors. Um, the, I know you compl- you complained about the um, the little boys acting, stilted beyond belief. But I mean, he literally was like what four or five. I mean, what else can you ask? Have you not seen Full House? The Olsen twins were toddlers and were acting way better than this. I enjoyed the cinematography of the film. Um, so yeah, like it, I think it just wasn't exceptionally remarkable and, and it didn't do anything exceptionally like creative, I guess you would say, but it wasn't, it wasn't bad. Um, okay. So the next question is, what do you think they got wrong about the message of the film, which are maybe the theology or they taught how they handled what their subject matter. Um, so I'm going to take a, a, just two take one point and turn it into two. Um, I mentioned it earlier, the the fact that the church didn't actually believe, either believe in heaven or were willing to listen to the pastor. I'm not saying the pastors are meant to be uh, perfect or inerrant, but what I'm saying is if the pastor is supposed to be the head of the church and the pastor is going through kind of a critical time, I mean, he got severely injured earlier in the movie. As soon as he gets better, his son is then hospitalized. So it's kind of a sharp hit after sharp hit. Then a financial crisis hits them. And the church comes beside them a little bit. But then um, he starts having a crisis where he's, you know, concerned about this. And to be fair, he doesn't handle it well either. If this portrayal is accurate to what really happened, he does not try to join together with a body of believers and try to reason with this he doesn't try to you know really deeply search the scriptures he barely spends time praying about it and he kind of asks a few questions to a few people kind of casually not really seriously and then the church turns on him very quickly and threatens to kick him out even though even though he is financially about to be ruined they're willing to kick him out of the his best paying job that he has simply because he's a little concerned that his son may be showing signs that he may have gone to heaven. And he's just concerned, what does that mean? Is that real, genuine questions that somebody would normally have? Um, The second thing, comparing the two experiences between Don Piper and this child, is Don Piper's message when he came back was to, first off, instill in them the, the fact that heaven is a real place, but that um, to be hopeful that those who are in Christ will have a home, that Christ is keeping his word, that Christ is there and he's created a home and that the hard, the pain that we go through on earth is worth it. There was no real message at the end of this film. There was no purpose for the child really. I mean, if God has somebody see something that's supernatural there's always a purpose behind it that was supposed to bring him glory. There wasn't a lot of that. There was a little bit towards the end, but it felt very forced. It wasn't most of this film towards the end wasn't even really God glorifying. It was glorifying family. It was glorifying unity rather than glorifying God. I give credit to 90 minutes in heaven, at least at the end you got to actually hear Don Piper speak at the end saying how, you know, why this is important, why Christ is important. This movie did not do that. Yeah, I think this is the biggest topic we're going to talk about. Um, So that's why I was trying to remember the production company uh, that made the film. Uh, The reason being is because I really... Okay, so the people who wrote the book are Christians. They... Really, this boy really had this experience. He holds today that he still had this experience. And he believes that Jesus is a savior. Like, he believes in Jesus. 
But you hit the nail on the head when you said that it glorifies family and unity. And that's very worldly and secular. Like it, this one felt even more because we said that 90 minutes in heaven felt like it was unbelievers almost like it was unbelievers trying to make a, su- a movie about a subject or something they didn't really know. This film portrayed Jesus as like a guidance counselor almost like he was yes. regluing the family back together like a spiritual guide and st- other than a like who he really is you know the lord the king the messiah like he was more of like my friend jesus um and it was very problematic that was that was a big one um the way that they just kind of they ha- this is weird because they have jesus more in this movie and yet it feels more distant from the idea of Jesus. I'm going to say something real controversial here. I think there were less real Christians portrayed in this film than in 90 Minutes in Heaven. 90 Minutes in Heaven, I give credit to his buddy David, David or Dave, who was like actually like coming beside him, discipling him, challenging him spiritually. You know, wonderful Christian example of like a Jonathan David relationship. This movie did not have that. I mean, you had his best friend was cracking jokes, trying to get him to, you know, ask for more money or get more money or um, leave the church. Um, one woman was like the on the board and yelling at him, and his wife was like freaking out, throwing things. It was it was again. I don't I don't demean people who have hardships and trials. But if you're portraying, making, making a movie, trying to portray Christian ideals, you got to have at least one person or one way of portraying the right way of doing things, or you're going to leave everybody thinking a different message than what's supposed to be. Yeah, and that's that's the second point. The same one I'm going to ha- talk to you is so there is a character in here who is a woman who is on the board. Of the church, which she was I'm, not a deacon or an elder. She was on probably a a voting committee committee for financial purposes or um, the needs of like the community as a whole. So she probably would have been in charge of like women's Bible study or in charge of you know community outreach or something like that. Which or no, not De- well, deacons. deacons. It deacons. would be it would be like a deacon ship. They they just said that they had a board meeting, which was all of three people. One person never talked the entire film. Yes. Uh, and they confronted the pastor multiple times, demanding that he get his act together. Right. But she has a personal like vendetta, and she admits that she's angry at God, which is great. But her son was killed in Iraq, I believe, and she okay, so she is in a decomposition at a church. A church that claims to believe in Jesus, right? Sure. They don't really say that either. I mean, they had that worship session in the beginning where they're singing like old worship songs. But she literally says, the concepts of heaven and hell have been used to control people for decades or centuries or a long time. Yeah, they're just, she says they're just constructs or concepts. And I'm like, I remember saying, turning to you and to be like, well, okay, why did Jesus die then? If you believe in Jesus, why? There's no sense in Jesus coming to die and to save us if we don't go anywhere. Like, what is he saving us from? More importantly, why are you even going to church? Like, is it just for the community outreach? Because you could, you could work at the Samaritan's Purse if you really wanted to. or The soup kitchen. Yeah. I mean, you don't need to spend time at church. And then... Him and his friend, like, they're like, we want you to step down. We want to look for another person. Literally at the time where he is in most need, they are almost financially, they're going heavily in debt because they have a huge, huge medical bill because their son almost died. And now these people claiming to be Christians, claiming to be a part of the same church, come to their pastor and they say, hey, your son who had a spiritual experience where he met Jesus, the person we claim to believe in and is talking about heaven, that's just too much. And we don't want you to work for us anymore, therefore not receiving pay, therefore putting you more in a bind. That is like the most anti-Christian 
like idea in this film like it's like that whole situation i was like this what why are these people in church why do they go why do they have a church like the pastor he he admits he's like i don't even know what i believe about the afterlife and then his um yeah go ahead which is problematic if that is the yeah if you're a pastor that's oh my gosh that is that's like could you imagine if you you the listener went to church on sunday morning and your pastor says, I'm not sure if I actually believe what's written in this book, but I'm going to keep on teaching from it for ever, and maybe we'll figure this out together. And that, and uh, you know what? Oddly, ironically, I know that that does happen. Like, there's a lot of instances where there's churches that are just more of a um, staple of their community and not so much a staple of, you know, the community's faith, right? So, so ironically, that's very weirdly accurate in a way and i guess like if you can look at it in the way that god gave this vision to this man's son so that he could grow actually grow in his faith and be like hey you know heaven is for real but um tish but also like you sh- like what was the point the whole point of you becoming a pastor or a minister to lead a church was to uh, prepare them for Christ's second coming, which is about going to heaven slash the new earth. Yeah. So that that was just mind boggling. That part of the film, I was like, this is this is bad. What did you think about him meeting this sister that never was born and that she didn't have a name because her parents didn't name her? I don't know. It, I'm still not sure. I'm more convinced Tom Don Piper went to heaven. Okay. Um, I'm not convinced the boy went to heaven. Interesting. I'm convinced that the they kind of hinted at this earlier in the film, but I'm I'm more convinced that he grew up in the church, surrounded by you know his pastor, is his dad, constantly preaching things, and I'm sure I had just a innate suspicion that it was like a dream he had. I don't know. I mean, I get the whole sister thing and the grandpa thing, but I'm a little suspicious of it compared to Don Piper, who was a cognizant adult who who saw things and was able to relay them more accurately and more succinctly. Um, I also had like a little issue because the boy, if, if this portrayal was correctly done, then he would just kind of, he wouldn't telling the whole story at, at the whole, at once he tell part of the story and be done tell part of the story be done tell part of the story be done um and it was at convenient times it, it just he would say something at the most convenient of times well the whole like telling part of the story be done that's very accurate for like a little kid a little kid would like yeah i'll just tell you when i feel like telling you um i was oh but okay so he didn't know he had a sister that was miscarried. He gained that knowledge through this vision. So that's why I was asking because like if he had a dream, okay, but he still gained knowledge that he wouldn't know. Like he saw his parents doing things. And so, yeah. What do you think about that? I'm still too suspicious about it. I just, because from, I mean, I've not read the book, but he, there was no apparent purpose for his visit to heaven. You know, look at any time in the Bible somebody sees some kind of heavenly realm. There's always a purpose behind it. And there's the purpose always is to glorify God in a u- unique way. He, there was no, at least in the portrayal of the film, there was no glorification of God. And if there was, I mean, minute, but it, the way it was portrayed was more like highlighting family unity than, you know, elevation of God. And so that was my big issue. Don Piper's at least, you know, there was a defined purpose for him going and seeing the afterlife. The boy, I'm not sure. Maybe. But again, he didn't die. And that was another thing. Yeah, he well, didn't fully die. He didn't flatline or his, he didn't have, um, he didn't go into dead brain activity. He had brain activity throughout. Um, okay. So the last question is what did they get right about the message of the film is what did we like about the message or the subject matter? What was something that was good? 
they don't leave a lot to to um, be satisfied with in this film. Um, I hate saying um a bunch, but it is really a, a hard thing to kind of come to terms with because there's, there's not a whole lot that I found redeemable in this. The message was, I, f- I felt like, and I told Hannah this when we watched it, I felt like it was basically some, it felt like, and I may be wrong. If I'm wrong, I'm sorry. But it felt like somebody who didn't really understand what Christians believe were trying to make a message about, a make, a me- a make a movie about something that really happened and try to get a overall message across that it was very lukewarm Christian, like very simple, easy to digest Christianese, like love one another and community is the best thing and uh, you know looking out for each other, all those lovely things. Um, there wasn't a lot that I found redeemable in this. I'm, I'm sure you have something though. So ironically, well, I guess not ironically. No, no, no. The most, the best parts of this film where it talks about subject matter and the message of it, talking about seeing Jesus experiencing heaven comes from what the little boy says. The little boy in like a childhood innocence and wonder says a lot of things that are, that are, you know, profound. He talks about like, the colors in heaven are so bright. And he talks about, oh, we never have to be afraid. We never have to be afraid because Jesus is, is oh, that reminds me. He, he uh, Jesus is powerful. He's in control. He has a horse. And the pastor's like, oh, I didn't know Jesus had a horse. So we're like, that's literally in the Bible that he comes in on a horse, um, which is another thing. It's like biblical illiteracy. But he the things that the little boy says are genuinely like, okay, like, yeah. That seems to be, I don't know if he said anything you felt inaccurate, but he he says things that like in his simplistic, oh, he, so right after he has this experience, he wants to go back to the zoo and hold this tarantula. Um, and the boy, you know, the boy says to his dad, he's like, yeah, you know, I just wanted to do that because I don't need to be afraid anymore. There's no reason to be afraid. Um, and he just says these things that I'm like, yeah, if if I had an experience with Jesus, I feel like I would have those conclusions as well. And then there's one thing I want to talk about, which was different from 90 minutes in heaven. So the little boy uh, comes back and he's talking to his dad and he says, Hey, I saw your grandfather there. And he goes, Whoa, Uh, my grandfather, like he's like, was like my father figure. Like I'm like, you know, and he runs to get a picture of him and he says, Hey, is this the man you saw? And he goes, no, that's not the man I saw. And he's like, okay. And then he finds a younger picture of his grandfather and he goes, yes, that's, that's the uh, man I saw. Everyone's younger and no one wears glasses, which is interesting. That's almost like the new heaven and new earth where everyone is, new better bodies like they don't need eyewear they don't need anything um you know they have their perfect perfected bodies and they um he he implied that that's what he saw and that's how he experienced people that they were you know in in their in their perfected i keep saying perfected bodies um but in don piper's vision he said he everyone was different ages and that they seemed to him how he remembered them i don't do you have any thoughts on that or do you just want to like kick that under the rug or well for me one of the things that i in in thinking about it for two seconds (laughs) i did remember something that kind of i was okay with and if this boy really did go to heaven then it makes sense that he would he would not be god would not gonna god would not like overwhelm him with a bunch of new things um he was at he started off at the church that he grew up at he went to the park he went to he saw things that were common to him he saw his parents he saw everything like that um so it was it was very simplistic um and compare in comparison to Don Piper, who like saw the 
semi-biblical portrayal of heaven. Yeah, and that I think that also just speaks to the personal qualities of God. That if this it really did happen, and I believe that he had an experience, and like we talked about, how does the how do we interpret a spiritual experience when we come back into our earthly flesh? You know, um, but it makes sense for Jesus to be personable to the little boy and to take care of him in that way. Um, so yeah, do you think we've 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 got this one in the bag? I, I don't know if there's anything else to dig around with except for the one cameo in this. Spider-Man. Oh, yeah. The, the little boy loves Spider-Man. And I was like, "That's is that why they got uh, the Hayden Church? Is that why they got him? Da, 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 da. He, he literally has Spider-Man like everywhere he goes. It's very cute. Um, Which would have been me when I was that age. but Well, this is Metamorphic Sight Productions signing off. I'm Hannah, and that is... Will. That's Will. <laughs> Once again, I love having my husband here to talk about Jesus and movies. And yeah, see you later. Bye.